All right, everybody, let's take out our review packet. Once you have it out, let's turn to the part that says ecology. Now, ecology was one of the most recent units that we did, so this should really be easy to review. When we're talking about ecology, we're actually talking about the study of our environment. Specifically, we're looking at how living and non-living things interact. Remember, we had fancy terms for that, though. When we're talking about ecology, we're looking at how abiotic, remember A negates it, so A, we're talking about non-living things, and then how living things, which are biotic, remember that root bio is talking about living, and really what we're looking at is how they interact. What we mean by that is that all living and non-living things are connected in the environment. And in order to be successful, those organisms and non-living features need to more or less work together. First off, we have the term biodiversity. Bio. Bio again means living. Diversity means different. If we're looking at the definition for biodiversity then, we're talking about the number of different organisms living in a given area. So if we look around here, you would say that there are a variety of organisms, including deer, mice, squirrels, birds, amphibians, reptiles, humans, and then a variety of trees as well, which are also living, like oak trees, maple trees, maybe grasses, different types of flowering plants, all in this area. Remember, it's good to have a lot of biodiversity. The more biodiversity you have, the more stability you have meaning that if one organism was to die, that would not necessarily be totally detrimental or negative to the entire ecosystem. Another thing to note is that if we're talking about different ecosystems, we could give ourselves two examples. One example could be a rainforest. If we're talking about a rainforest, there's lots of different organisms that can live inside a rainforest. Because of that, we're gonna say that there's a lot of biodiversity. If we were to gonna, let's say, compare this to a desert, a desert due to its climate, talking about its temperature, and then also the amount of rainfall that's there, not a lot of organisms find that to be a really good place to live. Because of that, we would say that that has a lot less biodiversity. Moving on in ecology, we're gonna look at the food chain versus the food web. Our first term there is interdependence, and I've been seeing this a lot on the test. Interdependence is talking about how all different organisms interact with one another. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at all of the different niches that organisms can fill. And that's what each one of these are. Each one of these is a job or a role that an organism can have. Remember from ecology, a niche is really just talking about what a specific organism is going to be eating. So we have a niche is the job or role of an organism, and usually we're talking about a feeding relationship. So the first one is going to be an autotroph. Autotrophs are also called producers. And when we're talking about an autotroph, auto means self. Troph means feeder. A lot of times people want to think, oh, well, I can feed myself. I must be an autotroph. But really what we're talking about is inside of the cells. What's happening there? Your cells are not capable of making their own food. And because of this, you're not going to be considered an autotroph. Plants and algae are actually examples of autotrophs. Remember, photosynthesis is how they're going to make their own food. Now, photosynthesis is considered a process. The other term that we have to be familiar with is going to be the structure where photosynthesis takes place. So there are two words we want to remember, process and then also structure. The structure where photosynthesis takes place is going to be the chloroplast. The next biological niche that we're gonna be talking about is a consumer or a heterotroph. Consumers need to consume or eat food. The other term we have is heterotroph. These mean the same thing. They're synonyms for one another. 
hetero means other. Troph, again, means feeder. So we're talking about something that needs to eat other organisms. Examples of this could include things like a carnivore or an omnivore or also a herbivore. These organisms cannot make their own food. Our final niche is a decomposer. Now a decomposer is technically a heterotroph because they do need to seek out food. But they're a special type of heterotroph that we really need to know a lot about. Examples of decomposers include bacteria and fungi. They recycle dead organic material into inorganic material so it can be used by plants. What does that mean? Well, when something dies, there needs to be an organism to break that down. What organisms do that? That's the bacteria and the fungi. Not only that, but they're really important. The reason why they're so important is because they are going to go and recycle back those nutrients into the soil. This is what allows kind of like a natural fertilizer. When we're talking about nutrients, we're not talking about food, remember, because food, how do plants get food? They get food through photosynthesis. So really when we're talking about nutrients, we're talking about the fact that it's gonna recycle nitrogen in the environment. Now that soil is gonna be rich in nitrogen, which acts as a fertilizer, so plants can grow. Right? The soil is very, very good for growing plants then. Next up, we have how exactly are we going to go and analyze a food web and a food chain? Remember, a food web is going to be a lot better than a food chain. Why is that? Well, that's because a food web shows a lot of organisms all connected, whereas a food chain shows one single pathway for energy. If we're looking at this food web right in front of us, you'll notice that there are arrowheads. Remember, we don't wanna just simply draw a food chain or food web using lines. We need to have those arrowheads. And the reason for that is because the arrowheads are gonna represent the flow of energy. If we're looking here, what you'll notice is that we have an arrowhead. This is showing energy flow. I know sometimes people write down, oh, the hawk eats the frog. That's what that's indicating. A better answer, though, is going to be energy flow. The other thing that we're going to want to note is where does this energy originally come from? If I look here at the very base of my food web, what I'll notice is that I have trees and grasses. The trees and grasses are going to be examples of producers. Where do producers get their energy from? They initially get their energy from the sun. Now note, they don't draw the sun on here. Why is that? That's because the sun is considered abiotic. Since the sun is abiotic, it does not go on a food web. The other thing that we want to note is the different relationships. So here, for example, we have a mountain lion. A mountain lion is going to be an example of a carnivore. Why is it a carnivore? That's because it goes and it needs to seek out food, specifically other animals. Over here we have a rabbit. A rabbit is going to be an example of a herbivore. Why is that a herbivore? That's because rabbits are going to go and they eat grasses and other types of plants. The only one not listed here is going to be, actually, it is listed. We have the mouse. The mouse is eating both plants and animals. Because of that, the mouse, an example of an omnivore. All right, so we've got, once again, the sun. The sun is the original energy source. And that's for all life. All life depends on energy from the sun. The other thing we wanna know is about relationships. How do these things affect other organisms? So let's say, for example, we look here at the mouse. If I'm looking at the mouse population and suddenly the mouse population decreases a lot, what I like to do is I like to draw that arrow right next to the mouse so I can refer back to that later. They might then ask you something like, what's going to happen to the snake population? So I follow the arrow from the mouse to the snake. Hmm, it looks like the snake eats the mouse. Because of that, the snake is going to decrease because the snake doesn't have as much food then to eat, which would negatively impact the snake species. The other thing that they might ask is how would that affect the grasses? Well, if I look here, the mouse eats the grass. If the mouse population decreases, that's probably going to have an increase to the amount of grass. 
Those ones usually are pretty straightforward. People a lot of times have trouble with a two-step problem. It might say, how is this then going to affect the mountain lion? A lot of times people don't realize that these two food chains are actually connected in the web. What do I mean by that? If we follow the rabbit here back down to the grass, you'll notice that actually they are connected somewhat indirectly. If my mouse population goes down, then I know my grass population goes up. That means the rabbits have more to eat. Because of that, the rabbit population is going to increase. If there are more rabbits, most likely then there are going to be more mountain lions. That's because the mountain lions now have more food to eat. Next up, we have our energy pyramid. An energy pyramid shows how the amount of energy changes as you move up a food web or up a food chain. As energy moves up the food pyramid, energy is lost due to metabolism and heat. That's a really important concept that we see over and over again. Remember, metabolism is referring to those three R gents. Respiration, regulation, growth, excretion, nutrition. Those life processes that we talked about earlier in the year. Also, heat loss. What does that mean? Well, think about it. Your body's always giving off heat. The same applies to other living organisms as well. So what's happening here is that 90% of that energy at every single level gets lost. And again, that's due to heat and metabolism. The next thing to note is where do different organisms wind up living in this energy pyramid? Plants have the most energy, and that's because they get their energy directly from the sun. Level A represents the plants. Remember, plants could also include any producer, any autotroph, and any algae. Sometimes they might even use types of producers that you've never even heard of. So just refer there, and whenever you see that bottom layer, that's always going to be the producer. The other thing to note, en energy is never, ever, ever recycled. Once that energy moves up to the next level, right, 90% of it is lost. It can't go back down to the bottom. And I know what people are thinking. We're thinking back to those decomposers. And you're like, ah, oh, but what about the decomposers? They recycle. They don't recycle energy, though. Decomposers strictly are responsible for recycling nutrients, like nitrogen. They do not recycle energy. Right? They get their energy from these levels, and then once they use it up, it's gone forever. Another thing that you might see, which is kind of directly related to this, is going to be a biomass pyramid. So let's just draw this over here. Bio, again, is talking about living things. Mass is talking about the quantity or the number. So a biomass pyramid is the number of organisms at any given level. Remember, you always need to make sure that you have the most producers in order for the ecosystem to remain stable. So if you have a thousand producers, those thousand producers could keep alive a hundred herbivores. And those hundred herbivores could keep alive 10 carnivores. And then for the top level carnivore, it could actually only keep alive one. That's because so much of that energy is lost as you move up the energy pyramid. Next up, we have ecological succession. The example in class that we did of ecological succession was the 1980 volcanic eruption of Mount St. Helen. Ecological succession is going to be when if there's been a complete destruction of a forest, it's going to be able to come back. So right here, we have a bare field. That bare field is probably the result of, let's say, a forest fire, a volcanic eruption, a hurricane. Something has come and decimated the entire ecosystem. Eventually, though, it's going to be able to renew itself. And what we mean by that is, is that it's going to be able to replace itself. How does that happen? Well, we looked at the Mount St. Helen where they had those lupines that were growing there. That took a couple of years. And then after that, they got small little shrubs. 
eventually, probably if you look back at 100, 150 years, they're going to have a hardwood forest growing there. So over here, we call this the pioneer. This is pioneer. As time goes on, those decomposers that we talked about earlier, they keep recycling nutrients like nitrogen into the soil. When they do that, it makes it more and more hospitable for other organisms to live there. So this is the initial time. And then over here, this could be 150 plus years later. And here we see this is called a hardwood forest. This is the most stable. It's the most stable because it has the most diversity. You look in a forest, you see so many different organisms living there. You look in a bare field, not as many organisms can live there. What can happen if it gets destroyed by a fire, a volcanic eruption? It's eventually going to go and be able to restore itself. But like I said, this takes decades, decades to happen. Our last idea is going to be material cycling. These are when things such as water, carbon, and nitrogen are able to be cycled. We already did carbon when we looked at our respiration and photosynthesis. And we also did nitrogen when we talked about our decomposers and how our bacteria are able so to we are go. we talking about how nitrogen, water, and carbon can all be cycled through an ecosystem. This is really important. And the reason why this is so important is because now, since those different elements are being cycled, we're going to refer to the ecosystem as self-sustaining. If we flip over to our next page, you'll see a little bit about carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is like the deer activity that we did outside. Remember, carrying capacity refers to the maximum number of organisms that can live in a given area. Why can only so many organisms live in a given area? That's because of limiting factors. Remember, limiting factors are finite. That means that there's only a certain amount of these different types of resources. So there's a certain amount of, let's say, food, water, and then also shelter for different types of organisms. Over here, they also give you the term abiotic and biotic. Abiotic is referring to the fact that some things are non-living. And then biotic is referring to the fact that things are living. Over here, this shows us a carrying capacity graph. Note the dotted line. That dotted line actually represents the carrying capacity. That means that's how many chipmunks can live in this specific ecosystem. Notice it stays right around the carrying capacity. Every so often there might be a little bit of a spike, but then there's going to be a decrease because the amount of food, water, shelter, carbon dioxide, all of that is keeping this maximum level. Another type of graph that you might see is also carrying capacity. Sometimes they draw the carrying capacity like this. Two other types of graphs that you might see include a predator prey. Remember, whenever we're talking about predator, which I'll highlight in yellow, predator amounts are always going to be lower than the amount of prey. Prey are going to be more numerous. That's because the prey is typically lower in the energy pyramid or the biomass pyramid. The other one you can see is competition. Competition is going to show two species. One species is going to be better adapted than the other. In this case, if both of these are A and B, we would say that species A is better adapted. The reason for that is if you look, the population size of A is increasing while the population size of B is decreasing.